Welcome to What Matters to Me and Why on this beautiful Wednesday spring afternoon at UC Irvine. My name is Doug Haynes. I'm a professor of history and also the co-chair of the organizing committee for What Matters to Me and Why. We now are in our fifth year of these fascinating stories. And what's fascinating about the stories that faculty and staff share is how interesting each of us are. And they also reflect on the path that brought them here and why they're here. Now, most of you are familiar with the opening welcome, but I just want to give you a few reminders that we'll be recording this event for other people. And for those of you who want more, uh, so if you are camera shy, you might want to move to the back. Oh, no. <laughs> Second, each of you, I hope, have received a survey form. And I want to urge you to review and complete those forms and turn them in as you exit. They're very important to us because that's where we hear from you. Uh, we're also able to get suggestions and nominations for other speakers for our upcoming season in 2017, 2018. So please feel free to nominate individuals and you may also self-nominate. <laughs> we won't know. Third, uh, we're very fortunate uh, to have wonderful hosts in the School of Humanities that make this room available. And so to be good neighbors, I want to urge you to collect all of your uh, discarded items uh, and put them in the receptacle as you exit uh, because we want to continue this partnership with the uh, School of the Humanities. Uh, as per our tradition, uh, we now can say that since we're in our fifth year. Uh, the program consists of a welcome, which I have provided. Uh, but we also have something that we do that's a little different. We'd like people to take about a minute or two to greet and say hello to your neighbor. You can do that right now. Before, before I turn the program over to my colleague, Jane Page, I also want to make a plug. Uh, today is a very special day at UC Irvine. It's UCI Giving Day. Uh, and uh, I've been provided with a sheet of paper uh, that describes how each of us can participate uh, for as little as $5. It's a way for the campus to collectively uh, invest in what we do. And so, I want to describe how you can send a text and in the process participate in UCI Giving Day. First, compose a new text message. <laughs> Type, zot, zot, give. That's Z-O-T, Z-O-T, G-I-V-E. Zot, zot, give. And then, this is the hard part, hit send. And then from there, click on the link to complete your gift. And so please think about giving later today, if not now. But now I want to turn over the program to my colleague, Jane Page, who will introduce our featured presenter, uh, uh, Gary Busby. Thank you very much. Um, my name is Jane Page and I'm a professor in the drama department and I serve on the What Matters to Me and Why committee. Thank you so much for joining us today. It's truly my pleasure to get to introduce my colleague and my friend, Dr. Gary Busby. Gary was born and raised in Southern California and is one of eight children. Dr. Busby has a master's in music and a doctorate in musical arts, both from UCLA. He's had a varied career as a pianist, a singer, conductor, teacher, administrator, and music critic. He is a versatile conductor and his credits span both theater, musical theater and opera from Stephen Schwartz to Igor Stravinsky. His conducting has taken him across Europe and to South America. In May 2014, he conducted to sold out houses at Portland Opera's 3,000 seat 
Keller Auditorium, where he conducted the wildly successful The Pirates of Penzance, directed by Bill Rausch, who is the artistic director of the Oregon Shakespeare Festival. Busby is a frequent collaborator with the Oregon Shakespeare Festival. In from 2009 to 2011, Dr. Busby was the principal conductor of the LA Civic Light Opera. In addition to music conducting and music directing, Gary is a highly sought after vocal coach, singing teacher, and clinician. His students currently perform in leading roles on Broadway, national tours in Europe, and in Asia, as well as in several regional theater productions. He also has students very active in Southern California. This quarter, Gary not only serves as our chair, but he also teaches 30 individual students weekly lessons and teaches classics. He's really the energizer bunny. <laughs> Before joining UCI in 2003, Dr. Busby was the associate director of the Ray Bolger program in musical theater at, at the School of Theater, Film, and Television at UCLA, and he was a member of the faculty at the Thornton Music School of Music in USC. Since 2013, Dr. Busby has served as the chair of the drama department. Frankly, Gary's one of the principal reasons I have stayed at UCI. His heart, his dedication, his pan uh, passion are anchors for so many of us. And I am thankful not only to call him my colleague, but my friend. He demands much, he gives more, he carries himself with an optimism that is inspiring. His life has not been predictable or easy, <laughs> but who he is now is a testament to his values, his heart, his passion, and his vision. It's created through a most surprising and unique life. Join me in welcoming Dr. Gary Busby, Chair of the Department of Public <laughs> Thank you, darling. I'm gonna get you later. <laughs> What are you people doing here? <laughs> Don't you have something better to do on a Tuesday, a Wednesday morning, Wednesday afternoon? Thank you all for being here. Uh, I'm touched and honored and sort of famished, as they say in the old country, uh, that, uh, that you're all here. And I can't for the life of me figure out why on earth you would want to come and listen to me talk. But I, you know, I thought, well, what is, other than the fact that you know, I'll do anything that Jane Page asks me to do. <laughs> So I've been thinking about, well, how did I get here? And, and I, I, I mean sort of here. Well, I know I walked across the bridge, but how did I get here at UCI? And it's a, it's a, I don't know if it's an interesting story. I'm not anywhere where I thought I would be at this point in my life. Um, as a matter of fact, when I was an undergraduate, I thought that going into the teaching profession was the absolutely the last thing on the planet I would ever do. And then I went to grad school and I, it, it found me. And, uh, and my life has been the better for it ever since. Um, I was teaching at UCLA and I got a call from Dennis Castellano, who's the head of music theater here at, at UCI. And they were putting together a position in teaching singing for, singing for a singing teacher here in the department and asked me if I would be interested in applying. And I thought, oh, this is perfect. I will get a, because I was an a, a affiliate faculty at UCLA, I can get a tenure track job if I do this. So I came to apply with the full intention of using that to get a job at UCLA. And I got here and at the end of the day, Cliff Faulkner, who is one of our former faculty in the department, uh, asked, there was, you're supposed to give a talk to the faculty, which if you think this is unnerving, that was really <laughs> scary. Um, said, well, why would you leave UCLA to come here? And out of my mouth before my brain could even engage, <laughs> which is often the way I speak, was, well, you people have figured it out. And I, it, I, I, I was shocked, he was shocked, I think the whole room was shocked, and I went, no, that really is the case. And I think one of the things uh, in the 14 years of being here, I've realized is, yeah, you know, the campus obviously is growing and has growing pains, and my department is constantly evolving and, and learning more and more about itself and uh, dealing with the challenges of an ever-changing society, 
but I think we have figured it out, at least the recipe for making it work. And that's how I got here. Um, so what matters to me and why? Um, I think there's, a, I believe that most of us have one story to tell. And it's unique to us. Uh, it's our story. It's the only truth that maybe we really have. And, and I think for me as a person, uh, as a man, as a gay man, as a man from a blended family, uh, as an educator, the only thing that I, I really think I have to offer my students is to show them and model being authentic being their authentic selves. Um, and that, it is, that means that you have to be willing to not always be so pretty, because authentic is not synonymous with doing it right. Authentic means that you accept yourself and you ask the people around you to deal with you warts and all. And I think as, since I train performers, it's the only thing that really matters when you're going to watch a performer on stage because we can appreciate technical skill whether as a musician or an actor or a dancer or a singer and those are that's good and that's a good thing but it doesn't necessarily move you performances that move you if you think about it are people who somehow gave of themselves and they allowed you to see into their authentic being and so I think about why why I'm here and it's to hopefully try and model a way of being authentic uh, that l helps other people realize that it's okay for them as well to be authentic. And that when we are being who we are, even if that means we have to apologize tomorrow for the way we behave today, and that's an important piece of the puzzle, that we understand that being who we really are is actually the most precious gift we can give the people around us. And I think, you know, my own story, uh, you know, I had no intentions of teaching, as I told you. I had no intentions of coming to UCI. I, I grew up in Anaheim. Uh, and, and so when I went an undergrad at Chapman, we, which had a really abysmal library at the time, so we would come to UCI to the library, which was just the library. That was days it wasn't the Langson Library. And I would invariably fall fast asleep looking, <laughs> looking, trying to study because it was so quiet. And I, so when the opportunity to, to come to UCI came, my first thought was, I can't go back to Orange County. I moved across the country. I lived in Europe. I can't possibly do this. Really, to end up back where I started, what would I be doing? So there was that self-tape running. But I came because I thought, well, I'll, I'll figure this out, and uh, I had a wonderful experience while I was being here. I was offered the position. And then uh, I had to deal with the fact that I had to come to terms with coming back home and what that meant, living behind the orange curtain. <laughs> <clears throat> and I, all of those sort of self-imposed limitations. and. Uh, it took a while. Uh, I didn't give up my, my home in Los Angeles for six years. I would commute 90 miles a day. What was I thinking? <laughs> you know, I mean, it got, it got to the point when, you know, you're leaving at six and coming home at midnight. You're thinking, why am I paying all this money to sleep for six hours in Los Angeles? This does make no sense whatsoever. Um, but, I, but I think that my being here, my being in education, uh, how on earth does a conductor end up running a drama department? It still confuses me. I mean, my whole life is a series of, I thought I was going to be going this way, and the universe knocked, you know, broadsided me and put me where I'm supposed to be. And I think that's, that goes hand in glove with uh, working through life from your authentic self. Um, because I think it's the only way we allow um, something beyond us to help us through life. And I, I don't want to get too woo-woo about it all. Um, uh, but I, I do think that w very often if when we look in retrospect at our, the journey of our lives, 
where we have ended up is not anywhere we necessarily thought we would for most of us. Maybe for some of us it is, and I would love to figure out how those people, that's their journey. But my own is a zigzag of thinking where I was supposed to go here and the universe pushing me here and, think, and saying to myself, oh, I would never do that and ending up doing this and that. So <clears throat> I think having, having space to listen to the small voice inside is an important piece of the puzzle. I think it comes with self-awareness and self-learning. Um, I don't know if it's self-loving, but having, having a sense that we don't have to have all the answers I think that's an important piece, and I, I'm looking out in the audience, and a few of my students who are in the room, you know, thank you for being here, but, you know, when we were all younger, I think we all thought that we had to have answers. And I will tell you that you don't. You just have to ask questions, and listen quietly, and patiently, and maybe accept the answer that you don't want to get, and sit with that for a while. And then decide if that's something that you want to do or not. You know, you, we have free will. We're allowed to make choices that we do. But I think somewhere in our, in our existence, moving through life, listening to the small voice inside is the piece that helps guide us. When I was three years old, I had a dream. Um, and I walked in my parents' room on a Sunday morning and I woke them up which was, you can imagine, at 6.30 in the morning or something. And I said, Mom, Mommy, 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 I had a dream and the angels told me that I'm going to be rich and famous and play the piano on television. <laughs> and with one eye open, she went, go back to bed. <laughs> and uh, so it was an interesting thing because I, and, and I also said, and they told me that you wouldn't believe me, by the way. <laughs> <laughs> So she said, I don't know who these angels are, they are talking to you, but you need to go back to sleep. <laughs> but I must have kept it up. I don't, this part, I don't remember the story. Um, and, you know, about six years old, they finally bought me an old used piano, and I took to it like a, like a duck to water. And, and so began my life, and I, you know, I sort of was split between wanting to be um, Franny and Teichner, you know, or Gene Kelly, I couldn't figure out which. Uh, so, you know, when I look back on, on my childhood, uh, working in musical theater now as I do, and all the training that I've had, it's sort of, it, the, the road was laid out, of course, you just don't know what it's going to look like. Um, you know, I, I grew up in a family that was um, challenging, you know, I had my mother who could have very easily been a stand-in for Joan Crawford in Mommy Dearest. <laughs> and a father who had a bit of a drinking problem. Uh, and so growing up was, you know, I remember walking from the elementary school I, I uh, went to was just one long block down the street from where we lived. And uh, it was, we lived in a cul-de-sac and I remember getting to the edge of the cul-de-sac and tuning in to the vibrations to sort of figure out what w was the other shoe gonna drop? What was the, what was the room going to be like? And it's a hell of a way for a kid to grow up, I have to say. I wouldn't wish that on anybody, but I'm very thankful for that because um, one of the things that it helped me develop is uh, what I call performer's antenna. And it's something that I try to teach my students. When you're on stage with people, you don't, you don't have to be staring at somebody to know what they're thinking. You just have to tune in. And you have to tune in to an audience and sort of feel the energy in the room. And it's been a great gift. You know, uh, those of you who are in administration and have run a department or are vice provost or whatever, you know that you s how, what we do most is sit through meetings. And so learning to read the energy of the room and consider what, what to say at the precise moment, I think. Uh, I don't know that I'm great at it, but I think any gift that I have comes from the fact that I grew up in a family where I had to be vigilant. I had to be paying attention to the unspoken clues. And I think that's an important piece. And you know, 
I don't know that very many of us had perfect childhoods. What we'd all be a lot better off, perhaps, or very boring. I don't know why quit, quit, which quite. But um, I think it teaches us everything in our life. Gives us the experience uh, that leads us to our own sense of who we are. And. As related to that, you know, I, as I alluded to, I come from a blended family. My mother is, is Mexican, uh, first generation Californian. My grandparents were both born in Mexico. Uh, and my father is a second generation American. His family, one half of his family came from Germany. They're Jewish um, and uh, left, left Germany between the world wars. And I, I think that something that I like to, I ponder a lot about is lineage. Um, because my, my genetic lineage is interesting, I suppose, or interesting to me. You know, I, there's sort of two parts of my personality that come out that I, you can sort of link to my genetic code. But also I was very fortunate to have teachers along the way and colleagues along the way and friends along the way who I think are also part of my lineage. People who walk with me every day, whether they're still on the planet or not, uh, and whose voices I hear, and who I can claim as sources of inspiration uh, in my own life. Um, and I, one, of th one of the things that's important to me is to pass that tradition on to my students. Um, that they understand that they're studying with me or working with me, and that's one thing, but I come from and was taught by, who was taught by, who was taught by, and that that's all a piece of the puzzle for all of us. And I think we're all passing on a lineage to the people we come in contact with in the next generation. And I think the question we have to ask ourselves is, what part of the lineage or what part of the teaching do we want to make sure that the next generation pays attention to and holds on to? I don't have an answer for that. I just think it's something that we, we who are invested in the noble position of, of training the next generation of people, I think it's an important piece of the puzzle. Uh, living, living out our lives in an authentic way, um, claiming the goods and the bad parts of ourselves, showing people that it's, um, it's, it's about being a 360 degree human being. That's what makes us lovable. It's, I tell my students often, it's not the perfect parts of you that make you lovable. It's the imperfect. It's that's the stuff that people can attach to. It's the fact that your nose is a little crooked or you have a slightly snaggled tooth or something. Because when somebody falls in love with you, they fall in love with you for the imperfect parts of you, not the perfect parts of you. And as performers, we have to get over, and I think as scholars, as, as people in the academy, we have to get over our desire to be perfect. Because it's actually the imperfect parts of us that allows us room to have space for one another. Because we can see each other in a way if we can accept our own imperfections. And that's a, not, that's a tall order. It takes a lot of self-reflection. Um, some of it comes from having to have that experience. Uh, and some of it comes from being willing for all of us to look inside and to start the question with not, not with what is wrong with person A or person B, but Rather, well, how am I contributing to this conversation if it's a negative one or a difficult one? Where does it begin? Where am, where is, what's my role in this skirmish? And I think that little piece of it, for me, is sort of what's missing in the, the dialogue right now in our world, is starting with ourselves and our role in things. And, you know, I don't know, I don't have any answers for the, the way the world is going. All I can do is hope that the, the people I come in contact with, the young people that I am blessed to be able to mentor, uh, see that modeling in my behavior, in my way of being, as something that they can look to and 
uh, respond to at a certain point in their own lives. And hopefully it, it teaches them a way of being in the world that absolves them from a need for perfectionism and allows them to consider uh, we're all in this together. And that, that little piece of it is important to me, realizing that you know, we look different, we come from different backgrounds, but really, if you bore down just a little bit, we're much closer to being similar than we are to being apart. And uh, we were talking just a moment ago about inclusivity and, and diversity and in inclusive excellence. And I think one of the things that is important to me is that you know, people of socioeconomic economic means, academic beliefs, you know, gender, uh, sexual orientation, you know, give it going on and on, ethnic backgrounds. Um, don't pull apart and sort of stay in the echo chamber of their own belief systems. But I think one of the beautiful things about the university is it allows us, it, it creates the space in which we can all intersect and rub up against one another because we're a lot less likely to start throwing stones at one another if we each have skin in the game, to borrow my friend Jane Page's expression. And I think, I think that's an important piece of the puzzle, that we, each of us, have to offer our, a bit of ourselves to come you know, to every interaction that we uh, approach with an authenticity and a willingness to bring our woundedness into the equation and allow that to be the place from which we work, because if I if I allow you to see that in me, and I'm not afraid of it, hopefully it will allow you to expose that to me, and we can begin a more authentic dialogue. Um, you know, it's, uh, what do you want to say? It becomes a challenging time living, living in today's world with, with rhetoric going the way it does, and I think we may not be able to change the discourse on the national and international level, but we can make a difference in the people, with the people for whom we interact and with whom we're interacting on a daily basis. And that, I do think, changes the world. Um, I think one of the things that I, I do believe is that um, my goal is to leave my little corner of the world a little better than it was when I found it, where I found it, how I found it, um, that it, it's important to, to, to work for the best and the betterment of the people you are with, that um, everyone's success, everyone's success, the water rises all boats, you know? And I don't, it doesn't have to be my personal success, it has to be our collective growth and that is an important piece of the puzzle to me. Um, and it's hard, I think, for, for those of us who are uh, professors and scholars, and you know, we're judged on the base of what was our latest accomplishment and what is our quote-unquote impact, and you know, it, it becomes a problem for us to realize that uh, we are all, how we are, are moved forward in the system uh, is one that is looking at our achievements and it doesn't necessarily look at our authenticity. And that's not going to change, but we decide, we decide individually, internally, what our worth is. And I think that's an important piece of the puzzle. It is for me. Um, and so, um, leaving the world a little better than I found it is the goal. Leaving room for some wisdom beyond my own is a hope to guide, to guide and move me to where I need to be. And re respecting and loving the people who have come before me and taught me, even if the lessons weren't particularly um, uh, easy, uh, respecting those lessons and realizing that they've made me who I am today. 
Um, you know, I've had a, a fairly checkered past. At one point I thought I was going to be, I was in the seminary, I, I thought I was going to be a priest. And I quickly realized that uh, that was not going to be the role for me. Everyone, I do still have my Roman collar in my office if anybody needs to go to confession. <laughs> so, <clears throat> you get to keep that. Uh, and I've, it's been on stage several times, <laughs> by the way. Uh, but I, but I think that there's an element where performers, performers, uh, our job is to do some of the work that people in the in the dark in the audience, metaphorically and literally, uh, need help seeing. So we act as the mirror, and I think that's an important piece of the puzzle. And I think we have to recognize that our as teachers and educators we carry that sort of uh, same duty to do some of the hard lifting so that people who don't know how to do that themselves can learn and mirror that. And I think that's a big piece of why I do what I do and the way I do it. Um, uh, Jane talked about my uh, ability to sort of work hard. I was instilled that by my folks. Um, they were really hard workers and I'm very thankful for that because it taught me that it, I can still hear my mother's voice inside my head any job worth doing is worth doing well and you know so you, you do it the best you can it doesn't mean you're going to be perfect it just means that you're going to do your very best and at the end of the day uh, you lay your head on the pillow and you go well I did the best I could today and to the, tomorrow, maybe I'll do a little better. So uh, before we start the Q&A part, I would just like to say, you know, something, if it's a beautiful day today, but something that somebody told me a long time ago, on those dark days when it's cloudy and it's stormy, that whether or not you can see it, the sun is always shining. So thank you very much. I think there, there's time for questions, uh, yes? There's plenty of time for questions, as is our custom. Uh, we have microphones uh, for questions uh, to our presenter, uh, so don't be shy. And don't worry about leaving, I won't have my feelings hurt. <laughs> Casey Lau from the Graduate Division. I just want to thank you for um, taking us on that journey and sharing what matters to you and how you arrived here. Um, you mentioned how you came and not knowing that you'd stay, and now you're the chair of the department and well respected by your peers in the department, evidently. <laughs> what do you think is one of the biggest ways uh, you've seen uh, the department grow uh, when you started today that you're really proud about? I think, I think our department is really trying to handle um, the ever-changing landscape of, of the world that we live in and using our art form to be a lens through which we can offer to the campus um, a way to see ourselves. As I said, you know, performers, I think one of our jobs is to hold up the mirror and I think the department is trying to, I think we see ourselves, and it's not just the department but it's also the school because of all of the facets that come into play in making this, in making a drama production happen, but everyone is is built into the narrative of of ex, uh, exposing some of ourselves to ourselves, telling stories that matter to people, that they can see themselves and understand themselves, and r perhaps wrestle with ideas that they they wouldn't necessarily otherwise do. So I think that growth as opposed to just putting on shows. You know, when I, when, I, when I came for the first several years, how we processed building a season was very hodgepodge. And, and one of the things that I wanted to do is have our, our seasons sort of make a statement. And I think that growth, it, it becomes an umbrella under which the work of the department can sort of be sheltered and move forward. And hopefully be of service to, 
to our colleagues all across the campus. So thank you for asking that question. Mm -hmm. Anyone else? Yes, ma'am. What is your view on talent? What is my talent? No, what is your view on talent in general? How do in, you know, performance arts, if you have someone that clearly has a talent, it makes it easier. What about people that don't have talent? <laughs> 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 what is talent in general? When I was a church musician, I used to tell people, <clears throat> um, if you have a beautiful voice, you owe it to God to sing out and let him hear how, what a beautiful gift you were given. If you don't, you deserve to have God hear what a mess he made. <laughs> now, I also think about talent. What that means is how we define talent uh, is a very subjective thing. Uh, because if I'm trying to have your talent and I'm holding myself up to what I believe you are rather than looking inside and opening up to the gift that I might have, I'll never find it because again, it's not, it's not coming from me. It's outside in as opposed to inside out. The thing about talent is sometimes it's very easily uh, recognizable. Somebody has fast fingers, they have a beautiful voice that goes you know, through the stratosphere, they have a leg that just goes straight up in the air, whatever. Whatever that is, those are natural gifts. But real talent requires discipline and respect. And the thing about a talent is, it'll only get you so far. The, the hard work comes when you get to the edge of your talent and you have to, and if you still have the dream to pursue it, that's when it really counts. And first, you know, I was fortunate. I was not particularly talented early on. I mean, gifted in that sort of uh, way that you would call me a, you know, um, a, one of those kids who are just a, an amazing talent. I wasn't, but I, I had a love of doing it. And I think one of the things about talent is if. What, it's another synonym for, for, the, for the love of doing, literally being an amateur, you know, an amateur, who, somebody who does an activity for the love of doing it as, a prof as opposed to a profession, you know. So um, I think that's what I think about talent. Does that answer your question? Thank you so much. Yes, ma'am. Oh, yes, yeah, Susan. Hi. Oh. I don't know who it calls for trouble. I wonder, I know you've been in so many different performances and productions over the years. Could you share with us one moment that stands out from what you of what you've done that, that, that you feel, you know, you said the important things to move people. Can you share with us one moment? Sure. Well, I'll tell you how I became a conductor. I was uh, I was a comic tenor, a comic opera tenor. And I was singing uh, Don Basilio uh, in a Mozart opera, and the conductor didn't take my tempo, the tempo we had agreed upon. <laughs> and there's, I could only sing it at one tempo because that's just where the voice. So I was, so, I, I, I was so angry that I walked to the edge of the stage and hung ten off the right at the pit rail, and you know, like you're going to go with me. And I realized in that moment. No, 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 no. I am never going to be subject to somebody, somebody deciding for me what my tempo is going to be. <laughs> That's my job. So one of, one, of the thing, one of the signs in my office is, be reasonable. Do it my way. <laughs> but, but I will tell you that there are moments, you know, when you, truthfully, Susan, you, you actually don't know in the moment that it's happening. Uh, the, you get lost time. The thing about conducting is that you are simultaneously in present tense, future tense, and past tense all at the same time. Because you are dealing with what you are dealing with what you created a second ago, 
with what's happening now and that's adjusting how you're going to be in a minute. So you're constantly living in three time zones simultaneously and that takes a lot. They've said, I've read a research, some research that conducting is one of the activities, human activities that takes more brain capacity than anything else because of that particular thing. And so when you are in the moment and actually making music, uh, you don't, all you know is that you're fighting for your life and you're hoping to God you get out alive, <laughs> truthfully. And that because, especially doing opera or musicals, you know, it's like you've got two teams of horses. You've got one team of horses down here, another team of horses up there, and somebody yelled giddy up and they're going in opposite <laughs> directions. And your job is to try to be, to hold the tension of those opposites. And so it, it's that. Um, but there are moments when, what I realized why I knew that I was supposed to be a teacher is I realized it, it was better, I was better when it wasn't about me. The thing about performing is it's a business, right? And uh, I don't like the part about self-promotion, you know, making it about everything. I, I, it's just not built into my DNA. But uh, I think about performances I've done with my students where all of a sudden they step into their own moment of glory and it, all of the pieces line up. And those are the moments that I can tell you, I can think about our recent production of Parade uh, with uh, Jacob Ben Shmuel and, and, and Kelsey Jennison, you know, who sort of sang beyond themselves. And it was a moment that, I, you know, being, being the support underneath that, that's the gift for me. Thank you for asking that question. Yes. Hi, Gary. Hello, I darling. I just wanted to ask you about uh, musicals and opera. Um, and in particular, it seems as though locally, I'm sure in large part because of your efforts, there has been a huge resurgence of interest in musicals. And that seems to be true nationally as well in the movie La La and all mm -hmm. that. But I hear all of these dirges almost annually um, lamenting the declining audience for opera. And I would have thought that the two are somehow connected. And I wonder if you could comment on that. Is opera really suffering some kind of uh, withdrawal of interest? And could it be boosted by this renewed interest in musicals? Well, I, I don't actually know. Uh, so, our opera, opera is, I will tell you, is the most expensive art form on the planet. And so that's why it's always in danger of becoming extinct. <laughs> you can't do it cheaply. And so when you're looking at, you know, mounting a production of La Boheme or something new, uh, my friend Jake Hagee's uh, opera, you know, uh, Three Decembers or something, you're talking about, you think about how many thousands, if everybody on that stage is earning ten or twelve thousand dollars, and everybody in the pit is earning five hundred or eight hundred dollars for a performance. You just see, a, and, and the costumes and the sets and the lighting, and you know what I mean. It, it's an, an astronomical uh, art form, ex astronomically expensive. Musicals, I think, musicals speak to a bit more of an immediate. Uh, nature in human beings that doesn't take as much work to understand. You know, opera is a high art. And I was trained as an opera singer and an opera conductor. That's how I started. And I think that that is an important piece. But what happens is musicals, of course, in America especially, it is the American art form. We, America is created the genre of musicals. We took it from operetta and from music hall and stuff like that, but the, it, it was born in America. So I think part of it is it's a natural outgrowth of our culture. And I do think there's a difference between um, operatic performance style and music theater performance style, um, which is in opera because first of all you're performing without microphones usually so how much sound you can produce can you be heard in the back row all of those things is a factor beauty of tone all of that stuff where in musicals of course that's a that's an important piece of the puzzle 
But by and large, musicals are really about connecting to the emotional core and that the performer, even if they don't have a beautiful voice, has the ability to reach an audience. You know, you think about people like Elaine Stritch, hardly a beautiful <laughs> instrument, but the ability, you, you could never put Elaine Stritch in an opera, for example, you know what I mean? It, so I think there's, there's the, the difference is that musicals, I think, speak to people on a much more visceral and heart level. Opera is on, from a heart and intellect level. I mean, that would be my sort of way of looking at it, but. Yes. I'm sure you've inspired a lot of students over the years, so is any reflections on a particular student that, that achieved uh, something or that uh, came back and told you what an uh, you know, inspiration this guy and you were specifically? Uh, I can think of, uh, we have a student who is now uh, applied to and was accepted to the public policy program here at UCI. He's a per music theater performer. Thank you for joining us. Uh, and he used his time as a performer, and he wants to get into politics. And, you know, I mean, it's not very... <laughs> clearly, it's, there's a path laid out for him, isn't there? <laughs> Hopefully with a little bit more intellect and respect for the world <laughs> from what he will carry with him <laughs> as, a, as a former anteater. So those, that's the first person who comes to mind. Thank you for asking. Are we, I want to make sure we're respectful of everyone's time. Anybody else have a... Burning question? question? Sure. You're one of eight children. Where yes. are you in that order? I <laughs> okay, so I am either the oldest of two, the fourth of five, <laughs> or the seventh of eight, depending on how you order family systems. So it's his, hers, and ours. My dad had three, my mom had three, and they had me and my younger sister together. So depending, and, and so for a lot of my life, uh, I grew up with my mother's kids, so there was the five of us. But I, I had awareness, my, my dad's older kids were older, so they were already out of the house. But they were part of the fabric of my family. But really, basically, in my life, it was me and my younger sister. So I got to be the boss some of the time. <laughs> I mean, that's, I think, why I ended up doing what I'm doing is because I was born bossy. And just, <laughs> you know, there was nothing left for me to do. Thank you. Let's give Dr. Thank you all. <laughs>